Okay. Well, again, thank you for joining us for Zoom into Archaeology. My name is Nicole Grenan, but I'm more importantly, I'm here to introduce Emily Jane Murray, who is a public archaeologist for FPAN's Northeast Regional Center, which is based out of Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida. So without further ado, Emily Jane, I'm going to let you take it away. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me to come hang out. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, we always say it's only fun when others play along. So uh, excited to have a good group of folks to talk to you today about fantastic archaeology. And this is definitely one of my favorite talks to give. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that is and tackle some fraud myths and mysteries from Florida and beyond. So before we talk about what fantastic archaeology is, let's talk a little bit about what archaeology is in general. So archaeologists, we study people from the past through the things that they left behind. Um, so we do go dig up artifacts, we uh, analyze them, we spend a lot of time looking at them, but really that's just our data point. So we're really uh, using those as tools to figure out what people were doing, really looking at culture from the past and um, what people's lives were like. Uh, it is a science, and I like to joke we borrow, beg, borrow, and steal all of the best parts of other types of sciences. So we, you know, take take from geology and biology as well as social sciences and um, kind of use all sorts of tools. Uh, and the most important tool we use is the scientific method. So we, uh, you know, develop a research question, a hypothesis, we go out and collect data, we analyze it, and we figure out, um, you know, what does that tell us about our research question and our hypothesis and as a scientific endeavor, we don't, uh, you know, you want it, you want your results to be replicable. And that's kind of tricky with archaeology because you can't dig the same hole twice. Um, archaeology is a very destructive science. So, you know, we're studying a site, we're studying the features, the artifacts. Uh, and when we remove them from the ground, we can't put them back for somebody else to come and look at. So the way that we make our our um, results replicable is by taking really good notes. So we, um, you know, record all sorts of information and we're really recording the context and provenience of all of these artifacts. So where they were on the ground, what they were next to, what color the dirt was, what texture it was, um, all sorts of information like that. And we, you know, include all of this when we type up our results so that people don't just see what we found, they also see how we found it. They can see the, um, the process and understand you know, what methods we used, and they can kind of, you know, recreate the dig by reading the report and understanding what was there. And that gets us to our last, you know, big tenet of it is peer review. So we uh, make sure that we publish our results and share them with not just our colleagues um, for, for scrutiny and for them to, to learn and to see if they agree with it all. Uh, but it's also really important to share it with the public, which is, you know, what FPAN is all about. So, so sharing that information and um, in, in the process and all of that that I've, I've discussed. So what is archaeology not? <laughs> um, it is not, you know, using our beliefs in religion. We can't take things that are not testable, that we can't prove to be true or not true. We're not focused on that. Um, we do study other people's beliefs in religion, but we're not kind of using um, our own to help guide our research. Um, it's not default reasoning, so we don't want to make huge, wide, broad assumptions. Um, so a great example of what default reasoning is to say, all birds fly. Um, so we don't want to make assumptions about people from the past saying, all people did this, or this is always what happened. Um, because we know there's always exceptions to the rule, especially people. People do some weird things, and there's always going to be an exception to even the best rule that you have. Um, so we don't want to walk in and try to make these broad generalizations and, and fall back into that. Um, and we're not positing. You know, we're not assuming things about the past. We really want to find the evidence, and we want to see where that takes us and be able to um, kind of use that to support the, the arguments that we make and the, the research that we're doing and, and the results that we find. So fantastic archaeology uh, is what uh, Kevin, uh, excuse me, Kenneth Fetter, um, he literally wrote the book on it, um, but it's what he's called uh, pseudoscience, so pseudo-archaeology. So this is, um, you know, basically archaeology that claims to, to be scientific, um, but they're not really using, you know, the scientific method. They're not going through all this rigorous process that I've talked about. Um, and there's all sorts of types of pseudoscience, you know, in all sorts of fields. And so this is just kind of looking at um, these stories that we hear and in, in, in the ways uh, people do that in archaeology. 
so we'll take a look at some, some famous frauds first, and we'll talk about some myths from Florida uh, and then the mysteries. Um, but before we do that, why would people do any of these things? Um, and we'll kind of hit on a bunch of these topics here through our, our examples. Uh, fame and fortune, first and foremost, right? You want to make a name for yourself. You want to get some money in the bank. Um, and that's definitely behind some of the, the frauds that we see through some of the things that we're doing. Um, nationalism is a huge one. Uh, and that literally the textbook example of nationalist archaeology uh, is actually Hitler and um, the rise of Nazism. And you know, he tries to support some of the actions he takes by invading countries. You know, it's, he's reclaiming what was once Germany and he's using archaeology and, and history um, that's not really quite accur accurate and grounded in fact uh, to support these claims that he does. Um, a lot of folks use this to try to support, you know, their religious beliefs. And, you know, we can um, prove some facts, but it's really hard to prove other things. Um, and then, you know, this idea of the romantic past. And this is really, I think, the, the most common thing that we see here in Florida is that people just want to look back at the past with rose-colored glasses. They want to remember, um, you know, the best of things, and they want to paint this, this narrative that's nice. Um, but those narratives often leave out crucial information. They leave out lots of people, uh, and they can leave out facts, you know, that, that really kind of give us the whole, the whole past, right? They don't, and, and so... Um, Mental instability. Some people just, just it, it doesn't all click up there, and so they can come up with some things. Um, revenge. I have a great revenge story, great spite story, uh, and mistakes. You know, we can't underestimate. People make mistakes. Uh, it can be simple as simple as like a transcription error, uh, and then it can just snowball from there. And it's really hard. I, I think we can all agree sometimes to admit that we were wrong, and that's where some of these things come from. Is just people being un unwilling to admit their mistakes. Uh, we see these tales perpetuated. Uh, one of the big places today is on television. Um, you know, there's lots of other examples, but uh, I, I find some of the, the television really interesting. Um, and they really lean into these things. And, you know, these are, it's entertainment. And I don't think any of these shows really claim to be the end all and be all and the authority on a lot of these things. Um, but really, the, the big problem is that people uh, on these shows, you know, they take the far-fetched, crazy pseudo-archaeology explanation of something, and they take the real explanation that's been scientifically proven, and they gave them the same weight, and they give them the same footing. Um, and that's a problem because, you know, they may not say, like, oh, it was definitely aliens, but, you know, it's like, well, it could have been. And um, that's not helping, uh, that's, that's perpetuating these beliefs. That's not helping uh, break them down. So I, I don't mean to hate, I'm sure, you know, these are fun shows to watch. I know they're fun. Um, so I don't mean to hate on anyone for watching them. And please do continue enjoying them. But uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. You know, think about um, what ideas are they putting forth and what kind of support are they giving to some of those ideas. So what's the harm? I'm saying these are fun TV shows. What We all like to watch Ancient Aliens and see those crazy memes, right? Um, but these things can cause problems. Um, and I think in today, especially during the pandemic, we can see some of the issues with pseudoscience floating around and misinformation floating around. And it can cause people uh, to, you know, literally be harmed physically. And, and um, so some of the things that happen uh, with, you know, pseudo-archaeology, we see a lot of these ideas are based in racism and prejudice and bigotry, and they perpetuate those ideas. Um, instead of helping to disband them and dispel them and, and break down and, and, you know, provide better information. Uh, and that's a, that's a problem because we see, uh, you know, these, these prejudices get perpetuated. Um, it can divert from real scientific discovery. So if you're getting hit by all sorts of, you know, golden galleons that are found in shipwrecks all the time, then you don't actually, you, you may not realize that something, you know, real was found. You may not, you know, you're not paying any attention to it. Um, it can be dangerous. Uh, it can cause you embarrassment or, you know, we want people to be excited about Florida archaeology and not be afraid of the resources or feel awkward around them. Uh, and it can result in financial loss for institutions, for, you know, researchers, for, uh, for any number of people involved in this. So to the fun parts, um, some of my favorite big frauds, uh, the Cardiff Giant. 
So this was um, discovered back in 1869 uh, on a farm in New York State. Um, and the mastermind behind this, this, uh, this hoax is George Hull. And this is a good like revenge story. Um, somebody upset him uh, and he felt, you know, this, whoever had uh, too strong of religious beliefs and he wanted to, you know, make fun of this guy. Um, and so, you know, he's like, well, you think everything in the Bible is literal, like there's not giants. So he decided to make a giant. Uh, and to see, you know, what would happen. Uh, so he gets this huge chunk of limestone from out west, uh, ships it to Chicago, has a sculptor shape it into the the likeness you see on screen, and they like put acid on it and beat it up and kind of make it look old. Uh, and then he ships it from Chicago to New York, buries it, and it's like his cousin's farm. Um, he spends, in today's equivalency, about five uh, excuse me, $50,000 on this hoax. So he sinks some money into it, which is pretty crazy. Um, and then the cousin, you know, is like, oh, I found this. And so folks um, get excited and it, you know, becomes sensational. It's in the newspaper. People start coming to the farm and they charge people like 25 cents to come see, um, to come see the giant. And so they make some money off of it. Um, my favorite, like, it's almost like a side story of this is that P.T. Barnum at a certain point approaches George Hull and says, I would like to buy your giant to put on display, uh, you know, with his curiosities and they tell him no. So P.T. Barnum creates his own Cardiff giant and then says that the original fake is the fake and his fake is the real, you know, the real thing. Um, so you have like l this levels and levels of hoaxing that's going on here. Um, and, you know, they eventually, uh, George Holt does sell his interest in it, and he makes almost a half million dollars off of this whole endeavor. So he sunk a lot of money into it, but he made way more uh, off of this whole thing. And they eventually, I think the cousin comes forth uh, first, you know, and people were suspicious. Not everyone believed it. Um, so it does get kind of debunked a few years later. Uh, but it, you know, it's still a, a pretty infamous hoax that happened. Uh, another really big one is the Kensington runestone, and this was found uh, in a farm out in Minnesota, and it's, you know, it's proof that the Vikings made it to Minnesota. Um, and I don't know if anyone ever, we may never know the real story to this. Um, it's been pretty well debunked on a whole different, all sorts of different lines of evidence, um, you know, looking at the engraving and the translation of the runes, where it was supposed to be found. Um, the biggest thing to think about is if it's proof that Vikings were there, um, you know, well, what other materials are there, right? People don't just uh, come through an area and leave nothing but one item, right? I've been to enough parks to know, even when people try to be really good, they leave litter behind, right? Um, so we have other examples of Viking settlements here in the New World, um, Lonsa Meadows up in Canada. Uh, there's structures, there's tons of artifacts, there's garbage, there's all sorts of cool stuff that's there. Um, but there was nothing else found except for this huge rock out in Minnesota. So it's, it's really, you know, it had to have been created by somebody else. Um, the best explanation that anyone has is that there were a couple of folks who were, you know, from Scandinavia who were there and maybe they carved it. Uh, I don't know if it was supposed to be a hoax, if they were just having fun, if they were just playing around, um, who knows. But they, you know, no one ever really came forward and, and, and claimed it, so. Uh, and then the next big hoax uh, is the Piltdown Man. And this is a, a pretty interesting one. Um, this one was not like fully debunked for like 50 years almost. Um, so this is uh, a jawbone you can see here that was found on a farm in England by a gentleman and he took it to like the British Museum. Um, and this is a time where, you know, people have heard from Darwin about the origin of species and they've, you know, we've, we've all kind of, everyone's started accepting it. Um, and so people go on the hunt for the missing link, you know, so this idea of, you know, we have humans and we had even found some pre-human ancestors, but trying to find that one species that connects, uh, you know, apes with humans if we go far enough back. So people are on the hunt for this. And so they believe that this could be it. And it gets, um, you know, all sorts of global recognition. People write a lot about it. Um, there are some people who doubt it, uh, but it takes almost 50 years. It's not uh, until the 1950s that it's like fully 100% scientifically like this is wrong. This is not true. 
Um, what it is, is it's an orangutan jaw that he like shoved some, some kind of other teeth in there. Uh, so my, my biggest question is how does some farmer in England even get a hold of orangutan jaw? But there you go. Uh, and it fooled people for quite a while. So, so moving into, um, you know, some of the myths that we see here, uh, the big one that starts here in North America in the 1800s um, is the myth of the mound builder. So a lot of people at this point, uh, you know, we've dealt with England and we have, we're our own people and we start exploring and there's, um, you know, people moving around uh, throughout North America and they start to find these crazy sites, uh, places like the Serpent Mound here, where it, it's earthenwork. So it's made out of dirt and it's in the shape of this giant serpent. And there's several sites that are kind of like this that are these uh, big animals and interesting things. Um, there's also sites like Cahokia, so this is in Collinsville, Illinois, on the banks of this um, Mississippi River up across from um, St. Louis, Missouri, and the main mound picture here is like bigger than the pyramids of Giza, like by several times, it's huge. Um, there's a huge palisaded wall. The population of this place at its height, which was around 1200 AD, uh, there were more people living there than there were in London at the same time. So this was this huge place, tons and tons of mounds. So people are seeing these things and they can't really figure out who made them. Um, there's a lot of folks who come down to Florida in the late 1800s and they're trying to figure out if they're man-made mounds or if people made the mounds. Um, and, you know, we also, at this point, uh, the, a lot of native peoples have been displaced. They've been um, killed. They've been reconfigured on the landscape. Um, so there's also this kind of disconnect between native folks uh, and, and the landscapes that they're from. And so, uh, and, and the ideas of like the noble savage and all these things. So basically, you know, the, the white folks exploring these places just don't believe that Native Americans made these sites. They start to excavate the mounds. They find beautiful pottery, worked copper, bones, things like that. Um, so this idea begins to build that there was a lost tribe of Israel who was here that must have built a lot of these sites and produced these items um, and that something happened and that they're no longer here and it could have been, um, you know, that the Native Americans uh, killed them all or, you know, any number of things. But um, yeah, essentially, you know, it's kind of disconnecting the Native peoples with these sites of their ancestors uh, and, and kind of thinking that somebody from the West must have built them. Uh, and this, you know, was once again not believed by everybody at the time, and it was pretty well dispersed, you know, the second we actually started talking with Native Americans and listening to their stories and thinking and, and about the artifacts more and kind of digging in a little uh, more, we realized, you know, the, that this is not correct. Um, but these ideas still linger on. They didn't stop there. Um, we see these kind of ideas come up again in the 1900s. Uh, with the hyper diffusionist. So, you know, diffusion is this idea that you start somewhere and it disperses, right? Um, so these folks believe uh, that uh, basically people from like Western civilization spread out all over the world and brought different tools and technologies and things around. Um, and one of the big books in support of this is uh, by Mr. Barry Fell near America BC. Uh, and one of the sites that he looks at is in Iowa and it's um, the Davenport tablet. So there are these uh, basically stone carvings. Um, and he basically says, you know, this is, this is like cuneiform, like it's related to that. And these people must have come over and, and put these markings on the wall. Uh, and there's a lot of problems with these theories. Uh, this site specifically, you know, okay, we have those folks. They left these writings here. What else did they leave? And there's nothing else, right? Uh, and other archeologists have looked at you know, this site specifically and, um, you know, put the, the scratches under microscopes and really looked at them. Uh, and it, they're probably just tool sharpening marks, you know, from people like playing around or sharpening their tools. Um, but these ideas basically that, uh, you know, folks from the West would have come over and, and populated the new world in some ways too. Uh, and this shifts uh, in, in, you know, once again, things that are still believed today Aliens, ancient aliens. There's TV shows about it today, right? Everyone believes it. Indiana Jones was about ancient aliens, the last one, the Kingdom of Skulls. And I'm sure somebody out there is going to push their glasses up on their nose and say, but actually, it was about interdimensional beings, but it's close enough. It's the same idea, right? That aliens came down and they brought technology and they brought tools and they helped ancient people create things. Um, and these are things that are kind of believed from all over the world. So here's an example of uh, Maya artwork that's supposedly showing like a UFO coming down and there's like ancient Egyptians. And you know, these are things that are believed 
uh, that people say about cultures all over the world. Um, one of the biggest supporters of this is uh, Eric von Daniken, and he writes in this book called Chariots of the God that really kind of spurs a lot of this on. Uh, and his, his theory is basically people in the past were too dumb to have built this. So clearly aliens came and helped them. Um, and there's a, we can talk about logical arguments there. That's some jumping ahead and, and getting extreme in your argument there. Um, but, you know, a lot of, you know, all of these kinds of ideas, the mound builders, the hyper diffusionists, the ancient aliens, um, they're all ultimately kind of rooted in prejudice. So this is um, from Kenneth Fetter's book, and he looks at uh, Daniken's argument of where the aliens came. And if we look at what sites he claimed have to have been created by aliens, you'll notice a pattern. They're not Western sites, they're not European sites. Um, they're from elsewhere in the world. Uh, and the folks that are writing this, right, are Europeans. They're white, white folks uh, from the West. Um, so it's people looking at other cultures and, and saying like, oh, you, you, you know, these folks couldn't have figured it out. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of, of prejudice and, and kind of bigotry and ideas that are embedded in these, these theories. Um, and, you know, it's not just kind of far reaching <laughs> extreme, like, oh, you know, you might be like, oh, aliens, that's, that's, no. Um, but there are, you know, folks within the archaeological community who make arguments, um, not quite in the same vein, but, but I mean, in the same vein, but not quite the same. Um, so there's something called the Solutrean hypothesis that has been talked about a lot in, uh, in the past few decades. And uh, basically this idea is that, you know, we know people came across the Bering Land Bridge and they populated North America, but what if people also came from Europe and populated North America? Um, and one of, you know, there's, there's lots of thoughts and arguments about this. Um, the idea that a lot of the older sites are actually south and east versus north and west, where they would be if people came first across the land bridge. Um, one of the big exciting things that people started speculating about and kind of growing these ideas about um, involves DNA. So when we started looking at um, mitochondrial DNA of Native Americans, um, mitochondrial DNA is something that is replicated from mother to child. So it's, it's you know, it's as close to an exact copy as it will be, right? Versus, um, you know, when you get half your genetics from a mother and half from a father and it creates a whole new thing. So you can trace lineages, you can trace family lines, you can trace genetics um, back through mitochondrial DNA a little more specifically. And so they started idea identifying parts of it called haplogroups, um, and they linked a whole lot of them that are in Native Americans with uh, folks that are from Asia, where we think, you know, all we think folks uh, from Asia, you know, dispersed from Asia and then came over. Um, but there was one group that just didn't make sense, one haplogroup, one genetic marker that they couldn't figure out. It wasn't linked to anyone in Asia. Um, and so some of the ideas were that maybe it was, uh, had to do with Europeans and they started doing more genetic testing. And once we, we did more testing and we refined all this, we realized like that's, it's just not true. Um, and then the other line of argument is that basically the stone tools from parts of Europe look the same as the early stone tools in North America, but um, there's another explanation for that, which we call um, independent invention. So instead of diffusion, right, starting in one place and spreading out, it's this idea that, you know, oh, well, somebody over here figured out how to make pottery, and somebody over here figured out how to make pottery, and somebody over here figured out how to make pottery, and it's not that they all got together or that one idea spread throughout, and we know that's true of other things, so um, that's a better explanation for the tools, um, and why am I spending so much time on this? These things do matter in, in modern day times, um, because we've seen uh, you know, if, if you now have arguments that Europeans were here, then that can lessen the claims that Native people rightfully have of land and resources that are theirs and were theirs and were their ancestors. Um, and it also gets into weird pockets of the internet with like white supremacists who want to make all sorts of arguments about why they are entitled to things here in America in ways uh, that it's just not true. Um, so these things do matter, and these things do come up in ways that you would not even expect, um, but they, they do keep coming up. Uh, so some more lighthearted <laughs> myths. Um, the myth that Native peoples were like 10 feet tall, I get asked all the time, were, were Tumuku really 8 feet tall? The Tumuku are the group of Native folks that were here in Northeast Florida and kind of North Central Florida, Southeast Georgia. 
Um, but this has been written about and said about, you know, Native folks from all over North America that they were 10 feet tall. Um, you can't tell because I'm sitting, but I stand about five foot, five, five and a half feet tall. Um, and if you laid out my bones on a table and you put a little extra space here and a little extra in between all my ribs and all my arms, um, I would all of a sudden be eight feet tall as well. So um, that's one of the reasons that this happened. There's some writing by the Spanish who describe them as being very tall, the Timucua specifically. Um, but some of that is also probably because they were writing, you know, these sensational travel books they were trying to sell. Um, we do know that uh, a lot of the native populations were probably uh, a little bit bigger than like the Spanish and the English and the French. Um, but that's probably because they had better nutrition, they had better sanitation and living conditions, so they just were healthier. Um, so they were a little bit taller, but they were average size by today's standards, right? Um, Ponce de Leon, named La Florida, right, named our state. Um, and he comes up and he, he supposedly lands somewhere on the East Coast and then goes all the way around the peninsula and he gets shot somewhere on the Gulf Coast and... Um, goes back to the Caribbean. So there's lots of uh, discussion and argument about where he landed. Uh, St. Augustine has long claimed it to have happened here. Um, and there's some historic documents that they try to point to. Um, there's a, a book written by a man named Herrera that is supposedly he got the travel logs from Ponce and, and wrote them out and published them um, a couple decades after Ponce was dead even. Um, and so he says 30 degrees, eight minutes is the last sighting they took and they came ashore the next day. Um, the book also says that he landed in 1512 instead of 1513, which is what every other historic document says. So we can do with that, that uh, 30 degrees, eight minute, what we, what we will. Um, there's also some folks who recreated the voyage. They left where Ponce did and they like, you know, took a similar boat and, methods and they ended up in Melbourne. So Melbourne also tries to claim that Juan Ponce de Leon landed uh, there instead of uh, up further north. Um, will we ever know? I don't know. I don't think we really will. As an archaeologist, you know, I'm thinking about what evidence is going to be there in the ground. Uh, and if I, you know, was driving down the interstate and I stopped at a rest stop for a day and then got back in my car and drove off, what evidence would be there of me, right? Not a lot. Um, and even if they did give things to the native folks that were here, they could have been dispersed and traded around. Um, so I don't think we're ever going to find that spot in the ground and we may never know exactly where he landed. Um, but it's, you know, it's some fun things to think about. Um, painted on top of Ponce's travels is the story of the Fountain of Youth. And this is something that it's like centuries after uh, that this story kind of develops that he was looking for the Fountain of Youth. He was not. He was just kind of uh, you know, surveying the land and claiming it all for Spain and, and looking for riches and, you know, all these other things, not the Fountain of Youth. Um, but at one point, I think we had 25 or 30 different Fountains of Youth that you could visit here in St. Augustine. Um, so it's definitely a very popular story. And we still have a Fountain of Youth archaeological park that exists today. Uh, and they do have the, you know, the fountain room that you can walk in. And when you walk in the door, the person working there turns it up a little higher so you can hear it bubbling and you can go get your cup of sulfur water and hopefully it makes you feel younger. Um, but the real story of this site is not Ponce and the Fountain of Youth. Um, it's actually, they, we've, we found out it's the place that Pedro Menendez landed and established the city of St. Augustine initially. So. Um, they, they landed and they moved into a uh, Timucua village that was here named Soloy and they stayed here for about a year uh, and then they, they jumped around a little till they ended up in downtown St. Augustine's current location in uh, 1572 where it's been since then. Um, but we found evidence, uh, you know, we found structures that were modified, we found European items that were there. So we have all the, the native stuff but then we found like these early beads and metal and um, trade goods that they brought. So. It's really cool. And the, the Fountain of Youth has, you know, they still have the ponds and they have the Fountain of Youth and they have all of that. Um, but it's almost like a study in 1950s roadside attractions at this point. Um, the, that park has been there since the 1930s. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting history involving tourism there, right? Um, but they have shifted a lot of their interpretation forward in, in time to the 1550s and talk a lot about uh, Menendez as well. So definitely worth a visit still. Um, Fort Caroline is uh, long said to be here in Jacksonville. So this is a French settlement 
um, dating to 1564. So it predates St. Augustine. And in fact, uh, you know, folks say the reason that St. Augustine is where St. Augustine is, is because um, Pedro Menendez came here uh, to capture Fort Caroline and to, um, to kick the French out of La Florida, you know, that the Spanish had claimed. Um, so a lot of the historic documentation talks about it being on the, the river and we have some, some images of it. Uh, and as I say, you know, it's said to, to be in Jacksonville. The river there has changed a lot. We've dredged it, we've moved stuff around. No one really knows where it is. Um, you can visit Fort Caroline National Memorial um, and the National Park Rangers will be the first to tell you that this is not where the fort was originally, but it's a nice recreation that they've, you know, built um, based on historic documentation. Uh, we do have one artifact that we have, that folks have found that could be related to Fort Caroline, the Beauvais Shard. Uh, and this is a piece of French ceramics that would have dated, you know, in the right time period. And it was found on the banks of the St. John River by somebody walking, you know, just walking around and just found it. Um, so not a lot of clues or context or evidence of, of where it may be. Uh, and there's, uh, this is not for lack of trying. I think there's some folks at the University of North Florida and they have put a shovel test in probably every single marsh that is at the mouth of the St. John's River there. And they found a lot of cool Native American sites, but they just have not found anything that's French um, or Spanish or any, uh, anything that would relate to this time period. Uh, in the past decade or so, there have been some folks from Georgia who have popped up and tried to claim Fort Caroline as their own um, and said that it was actually in Georgia. Um, but there's not a lot of evidence to support that. This is one of the maps that they claim shows, you can kind of see a triangular outline to the left of the, the road um, next to where it says Fort Caroline and they're claiming that's the footprint of the fort. Um, I don't even know if they put a shovel in the ground there to find any artifacts, um, but they definitely have not done, you know, a lot of this is just based on aerial LIDAR and photography and speculation and reinterpreting the historic documents. Um, but I don't think anyone buys it. I certainly don't. Uh, and then sugar mills and Spanish missions and plantations are something that have gotten all sorts of jumbled up in folks' minds. Um, you know, the Spanish, when they settled here, brought over first the Jesuits, but then eventually the Franciscan monks to, to have missions um, to convert the natives, but also to use them as uh, places to grow food for the Spanish and, and you know, to, to get folks into a labor force that the Spanish could exploit. Um, and the mission system went all the way to uh, Beaufort, South Carolina, all the way down to Miami, um, all the way over to Tallahassee. So it was quite extensive, not, you know, tons of, it, it ebbed and flowed a lot. Um, and, you know, there weren't, um, it didn't all exist as one huge thing. It, you know, like they tried in Miami and they gave up and they kind of came back and they tried. And anyways, um, but people around the 1900s started realizing like, oh, why don't we have any of these missions? They saw them out West and they're these big stone buildings. So they started to look around and try to find them um, here in, you know, Florida and in the low country uh, in, in Georgia and South Carolina. And they couldn't really find any evidence. And they saw some stone structures and some tabby structures and they were like, oh, these must be the missions. Well, people, like the day that paper was published, they were like, those are plantations. Those are clearly plantations. We know those are plantations. Um, and so there's some sugar mills that were parts of plantations here uh, that folks, you know, still are like, but is that a Spanish mission? It's, like, it's not. One of these literally says Beulahville on the side, and that's the name of the plantation it was attached to. Um, but somehow these things are still all jumbled in folks' minds. So, and then shipwrecks. And this is a big one. Um, you know, there's a lot of mystique and, and romance around shipwrecks. And, uh, you know, every single wreck out there is a Spanish galleon that is chalked to the brims with gold. Uh, and that's just not true. And then a lot of folks think, you know, well, what is the shipwreck going to look like? It's going to look just like the ship sitting on the seafloor. And that's also not true. Um, so this is a really cool image from um, a poster that was on the Manual Point shipwreck showing, you know, what the ship looked like, but what the site actually looks like today. Um, and it's, you know, a big pile of stuff and, and there's maybe some things sticking out. A lot of shipwrecks are even just completely covered in sand so you wouldn't know they were there. 
Uh, and there's an archaeologist working uh, here at the St. Augustine Lighthouse who did a really cool project where he, he looked at statistics and did some analysis. Uh, and in fact, if you find a wooden shipwreck here, it is most likely from the 1800s because that's when we had the most boats, and the most people moving around, the most you know wrecks happening. Um, so they're not often Spanish galleons. Uh, and they're also not often chock full of gold. So if you think you know there's gold there and you want it, all, all sorts of people before us have also wanted that gold. Um, so for example, the 1715 fleet wreck, uh, it got just smeared up and down the coast uh, and Indian River and St. Lucie and Brevard counties. And uh, the hurricane just wiped out a whole bunch of the ships. And um, the Spanish came and they were, it was full of gold. They wanted that gold back. So they came and they salvaged a lot of the shipwrecks. Um, and this happened all through time. You know, people wrecked the ship. They try to get what they could off of it uh, before it was all completely abandoned. Um, and then we see a lot of scuba divers, you know, starting in the 1900s to, to dive and exploit these ships. Um, so there's, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the ships just don't have much left to them. Uh, and this is why we encourage good stewardship at these sites because, um, you know, what is left is, can be really important. Uh, lots of information to, to learn about people from the past. Uh, and my last example I will leave you with is a really good Florida mystery. And I'm not, I'm going to let you answer this one for yourself. Um, do we have skunk apes here? Skunk ape is uh, the Florida Bigfoot. And so there's all sorts of um, cool research projects. We have a Skunk Ape Research Institute down in Southwest Florida. You can stop in and, and learn more about skunk apes. Uh, here's a couple of images of sightings. Um, if you want to try to sight the skunk ape yourself, I hear they really like lima beans. So you can set up some lima bean bait and see if that helps lure them in. And maybe you can be the person who solves the mystery uh, for once and for all and, and figures out if they really exist. So I just want to circle back um, to some of the thoughts that we had at the beginning of the presentation. You know, the dangers of pseudoscience, uh, they are real. Um, you know, a lot of bigotry and prejudice and racism can be uh, continued through some of these ideas. It can take attention away from the real scientific discovery. Uh, and once again, you know, just the belief in some of these things can, can be not true. Um, and I'm, it's especially important to be critical um, and to be good uh, consumers of, of information coming at you. Um, so I'm going to arm you guys with some tools to help you. Uh, and that is a baloney detection kit. So uh, I'm going to give this to Nicole and she can send out uh, and I can put the links in the, um, I think I think I have them as images. So I can see if Nicole, I'm sure she can send them out to you guys so that you will be ready to be uh, good thinkers and try to figure out um, you know, if what you're hearing is true. Um, and there's just some simple questions. This is from Carl Sagan's uh, The Demon Haunted World book. Uh, and just some questions to ask yourself, you know, how reliable is the source? Um, are there similar claims by the source? Have other people made these claims? Um, does this fit with the way the world works? Um, has anyone tried to disprove this claim? Um, where does the preponderance of evidence point? Is the claimant playing by rules of science? Is the claimant providing positive evidence? Does the theory account for as many phenomena as the old theory? And are personal beliefs driving the claim? So some really good questions. Um, you know, thinking about logical fallacies, and that's a really fun rabbit hole to go down if you haven't read much on those, is you know, what kind of arguments are valid and invalid, and um, you know, some, some ideas. Uh, about how people may be trying to argue points or not argue points in um, anyways. Uh, some, some good thoughts there, so I can make sure we get you those resources. Uh, and with that, um, I can take questions. These are some other books that are really great um, that we borrowed, uh, we, we used to create this presentation um, and some other fun ones. If you're interested in reading more on P.T. Barnum, completely fascinating guy. Um, but the bunk book at the very bottom, Kevin Young, that's a newer publication. And he talks a lot about that and gets into the fake news and all of the, the news cycles that we're in now. So some great information there. All right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Emily Jane. That was super interesting. <laughs> I appreciate you coming and talking about that today. That was, I think we've had a lot of, um, I guess, I don't know. We've had some very serious topics lately, and it was kind of fun to delve into something like this a little bit. So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, 
if anyone has any questions for Emily Jane, uh, feel free to, you can ask them through your microphone or feel free to type them in the chat box. I think we did have a couple of questions earlier on, MJ. Um, if you scroll up in the chat, let's see. Um, did Patricia asked if there's ever been identification of the haplo group that you were talking about earlier with uh, migration and peopling? Um, I'm not sure. I know they decided it was not linked to Europeans, but I'm not sure exactly what they found. So I'm not going to spread misinformation and just say, I don't know. <laughs> I know that, um, I think National Geographic has some really cool resources, like graphic resources on the peopling of the Americas and the existing genetic and archaeological evidence. So what, maybe what I'll do, I'll send out the baloney detection kits and then I will also try to find that link for the National Geographic website and I'll include that as well if folks are interested. That's a, that's a topic that's always really interested me too. So yeah, I'm happy to go find that. Um, let's see, any other questions? I don't see any in the chat box. Um, if folks wanna type questions they might have now, feel free to do that. Emily Jane, this is a good forum for plugging any programs or future things that you have going on. So feel free to do that. Yeah, I'll make a plug. Um, if you guys are interested in historic cemeteries, we are going to host our, host our first ever virtual cemetery resource protection training workshop on September 17th via Zoom um, from 9 to 1.30 p.m. So that's a Thursday. It'll be kind of morning. Um, and we'll talk about historic cemetery management, laws that protect sites, um, how to you know, ways you can help protect sites. Um, we usually pair it with like a, an outdoor component where we all go out and like learn how to clean headstones. So we're working on ways to adapt that art, but um, it should be a good time. And that you can, uh, it's on our Facebook page. You can, you can find that. Oh, great. I will definitely cross share that with this group and our, on our Facebook page too. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we did, we do have a question real quick and then you can finish plugging any programs. Um, do you have the, a photo of the single artifact from Fort Caroline? I might. I can see if I can dig that uh, out of a file. Um, I might. I will give it to you, Nicole, if I can find that. Okay, um, and I can I, send that out in the email with all the other stuff. <laughs> the all the yeah, I was gonna say, I think it's owned by the Florida Museum. So for, I, I don't know who owns it. I don't know. Um, it's not a very exciting artifact, I will admit. It's a um, tin enameled. Uh, coarse, uh, coarse earthenware so it's uh, very it's white and very chalky uh, white finish and very chalky paste so very plain yeah well if you find that let me know and I can send that out to you <laughs> for those who are interested um, Patricia's throwing you a curveball in our comments <laughs> uh, yeah any comments on creationism um, I don't, I, I mean, we have a lot of uh, scientific theory that talks about uh, evolution and how old the world is. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting. Um, I, I, I don't know, and this is getting into some of my personal thoughts. And so maybe this isn't as scientifically founded, um, but it's interesting, you know, I think um, there's a lot of like, like scientists that are also like um like theologists and you know to see like the more you learn about the natural world like the more you see like perfect geometry created and things like that um so i guess i just will say i don't see how uh one thing has to disclude the other um but maybe you know the exact stories that we get told might not be the exact way things happened but you know i think there can be um, you know, maybe there, there was that, you know, there had to be that spark that set off life, you know, and so maybe just, um, you know, it, it doesn't all, I don't know. Yeah, no, that was super that insightful. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds good. I think you're absolutely right. There are a ton of scientists out there who are also dedicated Christians or whatever religion they are, and they don't have a problem, uh, you know, with being both of those things. So I think you're absolutely right. One does not disclude the other, but as archeologists doing the work that we do on a daily basis, you know, we obviously have to stick to 
the tangibles and what we can hold in our hands. What we study is material culture. And so that's what we have to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, MJ. And then let's see, we've got a good question about resources for kids about Ponce de Leon and Florida and exploration, discovery. Any good resources? Um, <clears throat> um i'm sure there are i know i can recommend a few books uh a lot of the books that i know are more about um like menendez or about the Temuqua. um i can i can look and i can get that to nicole to send out um i can't think of anything on ponce de leon specifically once again a lot of what we do is um to, is specific to archaeology so we don't really have a lot of archaeology about ponce de leon we have more about like menendez so yeah, I vaguely, I feel like I remember some resource that the Florida Division of Historical Resources may have put out a while ago. I think it was a coloring book, um, but it had some really interesting historical information around that time period. So, um, yeah, I'll see if I can't dig that up too, and I can include that also. I need to start writing down what we're going to put in the <laughs> <you know? laughs> Lots of follow-ups. <laughs> um, yeah, so MJ, any other programs you have going on coming up? Um, that's the, the big one. Um, <laughs> we, uh, do put, uh, we have a, a video series called Tea and Trial that we post every week, which are, uh, interviews with different archaeologists about archaeology and field work and their favorite tools. Um, so you can find those on our Facebook page. Um, and we're, you know, doing as Nicole here, trying to get creative and, and come up with some more resources, uh, to put out virtually for everyone to learn more about or to archaeology so yeah and I will say um, Emily Jane and her colleague Emma Dietrich they the tea and trowels program that they put together interviews archaeologists and it's actually really really good so I encourage everyone to check that out um, and all different kinds of archaeologists not just Florida archaeologists so yeah it's a great series <laughs> thank you well thank you Emily Jane thank you so much and I will end by just saying that I'm starting to set up the Zoom into Archaeology Talks for September. I can't believe I'm saying that, but we're going into September. Um, and I'm really excited because in September, I've called upon my fellow archaeologists and historians at the University of West Florida, and we're going to feature research from UWF in September. So it will be all kinds of history, archaeology, anthropology, and topics that are not necessarily just Florida related. So it'll be the general research of uh, some of the really cool things that these folks are doing at UWF. So stay tuned for that. Um, that will be an exciting one. I'm trying to keep my month themed because it helps me try and come up with a plan uh, for, for inviting people to come speak. So September will be UWF Research Month. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I've got. Uh, let me just say thank you again so much to Emily Jane. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Please join us next week. We're going to be hearing from another FN colleague. Sarah Ayers Rigsby is going to be talking about issues with climate change related impacts and archaeological sites in South Florida. And that will be a really, really interesting talk. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And we hope to see you there. So thank you all. Have a lovely Thursday evening. And we'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Bye. Thanks, MJ. Bye. <laughs>